Okay, that was kind of interesting. Here's another one. This is kind of an extreme one. Occurrences here in the south, suitable areas in the south, and then a similar area climatically in the north. It's another one with a disjunct area not known to be inhabited there. Here's another couple of areas with no occurrence data to document the species there. And so essentially we came up with a bunch of these areas from a bunch of these species where they essentially fit the hypothesis of the ecological niche, but no occurrence data placed the species there. And that was interesting, intriguing. Uh, there are two reasons why the, or three reasons why the species might not be there. One is, is that nobody's looked or those who have looked haven't found it. Okay, non-detection, we talked about that yesterday, right? How complete are the inventories from those sites? That's one possibility. A second possibility is that the species is really there, which is to say this species is found like this, and maybe it does indeed extend a little farther north, a little farther south. Could well be. The third possibility was really interesting, that maybe that principle of niche conservatism holds, and it's not the species that we're modeling that's there, but rather some undiscovered sister species. And so my colleagues developed a set of expeditions to these key sites and came up with seven species new to science in these lineages in three expeditions and a bunch of expeditions to sites not so identified yielded only one species new to science. So it was kind of an interesting um, illustration that we can use these principles of niche conservatism, essentially distributional stability with respect to environments, that we can use those ideas to find new species more, more efficiently. So we can do things like this here in, in mainland Africa as well, except that I don't have the end of the story. This one's for you, LM. Okay? Um, Enrique Martinez, who was in Nairobi as, a, as one of the instructors for the niche modeling class. Enrique and I were playing with data uh, for African forest squirrels, and we were looking at the genus Funiscurus, and essentially we got the name of it, I think it's Carruthers Eye, but uh, we got a bunch of models and the points, just like what I just showed you in Madagascar. And what I want you to do is look at the disjunct areas that don't have occurrences. And what we see over and over again, in some cases I've, I've colored in the particularly suitable areas, what we get over and over again is a disjunct in the Ethiopian highlands. Okay, and if we look at that across all Funiscurus, here's another example, looking at it over all the Funiscurus, we get this very clear disjunct area where no Phonoscurus is known. And there's actually another reason why they might not be there. That this barrier is significant and the lineage never crossed it. Okay, that the site is inaccessible. So this is essentially just something that we tossed out into the literature about eight years ago. And the point is simply that if you were going to look for new species of Funiscurus, the Ethiopian highlands would be a very good place to look. Again, maybe it's just a very significant barrier right in here. And that lineage, not during Pleistocene glaciations, not at any point, has made it across that barrier. Could well be. Okay, by the same token, there are no Funiscurus 
on Mars, right? And there are no Phonoscurus in America or in Australia. So both of those are viable hypotheses. And the question is then, um, how carefully have people looked at for forest squirrels in Ethiopia? How well has the mammalogical work been done? And that's essentially, if you did thorough inventories in the right places, you could decide between these two hypotheses. No, it is absent, this lineage is absent from this region, so we're going to conclude that yes, this has been a significant barrier. Or you might just have some fun and find one. Okay? So now we get to the idea of prioritizing areas for survey. Um, this is some work done with actually one colleague of Tiago and Rafael and a couple colleagues from, uh, from Sao Paulo State. Um, but this is essentially, uh, we titled the, the paper something from nothing because we were essentially starting with literally one point. I'll, I'll show you in a moment. I have, let me jump forward. There we go. This is the Atlantic Ocean, this is southern Brazil, and this is one important region of the Sao Paulo state, and there was one known population, you can see it here also, of this plant. It's not an easy plant to detect, it's, it's fairly cryptic, it only comes out in a limited season, etc. So the question was, what can we do about this? Can we learn anything more? So essentially, what we did was this. We said, let's look at that point in environmental dimensions. Okay, so imagine I'm just gonna plot it out in terms of annual mean temperature and annual mean precipitation, but it, it could be any dimensions of the environment that are relevant to the distribution of the species. Maybe across your study region, in this case, that watershed that I pointed out to you. Maybe that's the set of conditions, okay? And maybe that's our known occurrence point. I mean, literally this was a single population that was actually, by that point, believed to be extinct. And so we were, we were basically analyzing ghosts, okay? Um, one single point, but then we might have another point of interest. And so there it is. And we can just take, essentially, a ruler and measure the distance from this point to this point, essentially how different in environmental terms is the point of interest, which could be any point on the landscape, from the known occurrence of the species. Okay? And essentially what we can do is do this for all points in the landscape. And so we can make a map of how similar environmentally the whole, each point in the region is to that one occurrence. So that's what we've done here. Essentially, uh, where you see red or green are areas that are fairly similar to that one known occurrence. And so we just developed this map. We actually then combined it with a map of remaining remnants of the Brazilian savanna vegetation. It's called Cercado. And a team of botanists went out to those sites, which is to say that fit this environmental similarity and that retained bits of primary vegetation. And essentially at all of these sites, they found populations of this species. Okay, so essentially what we got was something from nothing. Um, and essentially, those new points were very closely similar to the original point, whereas random points across the landscape of that watershed were generally quite different. Okay, and then what we did was we put the points into 
a more traditional niche model and developed something that was a little bit more interpolated. And so we now have a hypothesis of a potential distribution of the species in the region. So this was an example of starting literally with a population that's no longer there and coming up with it's a rare species, it's probably quite endangered, but it's also um, still extant. Here's a different example. This one's even more extreme as far as uh, how bad the point was. Uh, this is in northeastern India, so here's China, Bhutan, Burma, Myanmar, and India has this little neck that comes up in the Northeast, very difficult region in terms of politics. And in this region here, um, there was a single individual known of this species, literally down to a single individual, culturally important, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and my colleagues went out. That single individual was around this, it was one of these, and they went out and in that local region found more individuals. So it, in reality, it wasn't quite so bad, but it was basically one population. And so we did this same exercise of looking at environmental similarity. And so the dark areas are highly similar and the light areas are quite different. And everywhere where you see an empty circle, my colleagues didn't find it. Everywhere where you, where you see a dotted circle or a dotted square, they found some evidence of it. And essentially it comes down to this. The, the really simple niche modeling. Um, new populations were discovered at five of the 14 sites that could be surveyed. There were 12 other sites that were less accessible. accessible and my colleagues obtained indirect anecdotal evidence of occurrences at five more of those sites. So again, we go from a single remaining population to a little bit of, kind of local scale distributional data. Last example, this is a, a, a disease vector. Um, in Africa, you have trypanosomiasis um, transmitted by a fly. We in America have what's called American trypanosomiasis or Chagas disease transmitted by a bug. And in northeastern Brazil, so here's the coast, Rio de Janeiro is over here, and essentially the north limit of Brazil is right about here. There's a complex of these Chagas bugs, they're called, triatomines. Um, it's called the Brasiliensis com complex, and they are fairly effective vectors of Chagas disease in essentially poor human communities right now. So in 2003, a new species in this group was discovered and described as a species new to science. Okay, so literally, it was known from nothing. It's kind of cool. See in Brasiliensis, you see how the wings get all the way down to here? In Sherlocky, this new species, the wings are very short. And essentially, it's flightless. It does have bigger and more, more muscular legs, and so it's better able to walk. But for whatever reason, it's flightless. And so that's what we knew. And back a few years, some colleagues asked me, well, what can we do with this? And I was in the midst of playing with these ideas of prioritizing areas for survey. And so, okay, let's play with this. Um, that's the type locality. And kind of nobody cared about this species because, you see, there are no humans around. And these Chagas bugs, if they live out in the rocks and, in, and kind of away from humans, they're not transmitting trypanosomes to humans, and so nobody cares. Well, shortly after the species was discovered and described as a species new to science, 
it's found here. This is why you saw two little points in that map. And in fact, worse yet, you lift up beds and such, and the bugs are down kind of in the, in the dirt and garbage in, in, the, in the huts. And so literally we had the type locality and now this tiny little village. It's not even a permanent village. It's a, a little settlement for artisanal miners. They're getting like not even semi-precious stones, but like marble and things like that. And so the question is, given this landscape, and you can see, this is a, a satellite image, you can see a river going by, you can see probably highland areas, lowland areas, where else might this species be present? So we did that same exercise of measuring similarity and environmental dimensions to every pixel in this landscape, where you see red, it's closely similar to our known occurrences. And where you see white, it's very different. And the uh, local public health units went out and indeed found a bunch more populations. And look where they find them. Okay? Not here, not here, not here, but all in areas that were environmentally similar. So essentially what this allows us to do is if we really care about a single species or a small number of species, this allows us to prioritize sites for detailed searches. This is what I was after with your proposal. You, can, you might be able to find additional populations of this very rare plant. Um, in a niche modeling sense, this method is almost guaranteed to undercharacterize the dimensions of the niche, simply because we found these populations based on their similarity to what we knew. And so very easily, we might constrain ourselves to some subset of the true broader niche because we're essentially discovering things similar to what we know. So this is not an approach we'd want to use for characterizing that full abiotic niche that I talked about. But it is an approach that can be very interesting in guiding searches for additional populations or even for new species. So just to give a few procedures, when we have very small sample sizes, we want to characterize the environments of those points with respect to relevant dimensions of the environment. We want to use very, very similar, sorry, very, very simple um, methodologies. We can't do what everybody wants to do, which is use Maxent, push the button, and get the model, because the complexity is too great. We want to use the simplest of approaches, something like similarity. You can play around with which distance measures, but really we don't want to do anything at all complicated. And then we're going to search locally in those sites that are closely similar environmentally. When we have a bigger sample size, then we can kind of use more traditional approaches and, and you know, fit models using more complex algorithms. Uh, test those models to make sure they're robust, et cetera, et cetera. And then we can search perhaps more broadly because we're probably with a better chance of getting a better um, characterization of the full niche. 